All right, such an honor and pleasure to be hosting Lynn Langit for this uh, closing keynote of Agile India Conference. Uh, Lynn is someone that I've been trying to get to the Agile India Conference for many years now. I first uh, met her in the Yao Conference in Sydney. Uh, we, we sat down, she was kind enough to sit down and spend some time and, uh, you know, uh, I was I was blown away with all the work she was doing back then with uh, Dr. Dennis. Some of you would have met Dr. Dennis in the past Agile India and ODSE conferences that we've hosted. Uh, you know, they've been doing some pretty cutting edge, amazing work with, uh, you know, sequencing genomes and uh, doing all of that with, uh, you know, basically uh, function as a service uh, uh, architecture. And just the amount of cost savings that uh, you've been able to demonstrate has just been amazingly impressive. Uh, so, and and of course you, you've been very influential Lynn, in all your work uh, with the cloud and uh, data work that you've been doing. And I also see that you now uh, built a lot of uh, LinkedIn courses uh, with over four million, uh, you know, students. So that's a that's a huge impact. Uh, congratulations on that. And uh, without much delay, I want to get straight to the topic. So I request you to please share your screen. Great, thank you, and thank you, and welcome to everyone. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started on our topic today. All right. Well, welcome to everyone. And this talk is on cloud adoption patterns. And my name is Lynn Langit. So to uh, set context, it's interesting to note that there is a group that studies success and failure of software projects. They do this every year and they collect information and they publish it. And I have a link, I'll, I can make these slides available. And what they find is 75% of software projects each year, every year, have some or all of these characteristics. The first characteristic is the project is late. It's delivered not on time. The second is it's over budget, it costs too much. The next is it lacks key features. And unfortunately, the last one is it, it sometimes doesn't even work. And you know, one of the challenges of our industry is it moves very, very quickly, particularly in the domain I'm gonna talk about, which increases the likelihood of these situations occurring. So um, how do you counteract that? Well, you collect information about what works as patterns, and that's really what has driven the creation of this talk. It might surprise you that when I considered the cloud work that I had done as an independent consultant over the past 11 years, I, I'm really not making this up. 95% of the, the projects that I've worked on have, were successful. Now, I'll put a little asterisk here. I'm often brought into projects that are in a failed state. So it's not a true metric, but it's certainly better than the previous one. So again, how and why do the teams that I work with do this? Well, to understand that, you have to understand a little bit about me first. So uh, first I came out of the corporate world, 2007 until 2011, I worked at Microsoft. Um, and I was a, a global employee, focusing mostly on data. That's my background, data warehousing and uh, databases. So when I left Microsoft to launch my consultancy, although I started working with the cloud, because literally the year I left is the year that Microsoft launched Azure um, and uh, uh, Amazon was coming into the market, the first focus that I had was big data, and it was in the advertising and the financial area. And I you know, started moving people in really core patterns, lift and shift kind of patterns, but had a lot of success. Cloud data was quickly on the scene um, with offerings uh, from really the, all three of them. Um, I was working more with AWS and GCP. Um, I still do work with Azure and sometimes even Alibaba, but you, know, you can't know all the services. And so AWS was first mover. And so I often was focusing on AWS and then more and more GCP. In 2017, because of a personal situation and an opportunity, I pivoted my work professionally from financial and advertising to um, human health, specifically cancer research. 
And I started my first project with a group out in Australia that um, was mentioned in my introduction and really found that there was a lot of opportunity in um, cancer genomic research for optimizations around the cloud. And so I have subsequently worked only in that domain. Now up in 2022, I've had um, over 20 clients and have had um, substantial impact in human health and cancer and in COVID, particularly since 2020, um, and have elevated and escalated my journey because of some of the characteristics of um, genomics. And the first characteristic is there's data, there's big data, and then there's genomic data. Before the pandemic, one of my key customers before the pandemic was putting in 45 terabytes per day into, it was Google Cloud. Um, and because they were actually part of, in the United States, testing around COVID, that just increased rapidly during COVID. Um, these are data volumes that I had never seen in my uh, data career. And so working with customers to build solutions that work effectively in cloud with these volumes of data and with the complexity of computation that genomics requires because of the complexity of the questions that are asked across the human genome drives new patterns, which not only are going to impact genomics, but are also going to impact all of cloud solutions. So let's look in terms of patterns. And in this talk, I'm going to identify a number of key cloud patterns that'll drive your teams to success. It's interesting where this talk came from. I'm working with a, um, a big customer in the United States right now, moving a number of projects to the cloud. And they've had, unfortunately, sort of the typical situation, the 75% where a lot of the projects are challenged. And so some of the teams have come to me and said, you know, have you observed these patterns? And so about a month ago, I actually wrote an article about this. And then just coincidentally, I was invited to this uh, keynote. And so this is a new talk that I've created for you, but also for my customer. The first cloud pattern is in my opinion, the most important. So we're gonna spend the most time on it. And this is particularly for customers who are brand new to cloud. A key pillar of success is understanding and using elastic services. So in addition to um, talking about uh, patterns, I also want to introduce this concept that I call cloud smells. Probably you're familiar with code smells. Um, and uh, this is just something that I have used informally that I'm you know, sharing with, with you all here. So hopefully it'll be helpful. So one of the cloud smells around uh, this area of elastic services is when teams are new to the cloud, they have a very difficult time understanding that compute should be ephemeral, which means it should go away. Compute should come up and go down because you know they're used to servers and racks. And so it's very, very difficult and scary to think about VMs that are properly sized, do a job and then go away. So this is an example from this customer who's, they're trying to move a batch cluster from, um, uh, well, it's a colo, to the cloud. And as they're rewriting the code base, he is spending inordinate amounts of time because the log files are currently written to the nodes, which go away. So he doesn't have any log files. <laughs> so you can see here, he spent one week and basically it doesn't really matter the details, but to figure out he just needed more RAM for a task which is just, you know, this is what causes those 75%. So where should the logs be? The logs should be written to the persistent area of the cloud, which is buckets in this case. But this idea that services are, um, you know, gonna be always there is a cloud smell. So the other aspect of these patterns that's difficult is cloud has evolved in terms of the services. When cloud was first introduced back in 2011, 2012, and this is an Amazon architecture, you know, you had like five things to worry about, five services. So um, as, you know, they uh, were configurable, it was a much easier problem space. And as we'll see, this is sort of the second dimension that adds to the complexity. 
but let's just start with 2012. So we're talking about elastic services and that would be EC2, you know, or whatever VM, right? So uh, in 20, uh, 2006, Amazon, you know, launched really the concept of public cloud with EC2 and Azure and, and a GCP came along later with optimized sizable VMs. The second big aspect of working with elastic services and compute, the big releases came in 2014. And that's Amazon Lambda and uh, uh, Google open source and Kubernetes and Docker. I am also including another key service in here that I use on GCP, which is Cloud Run, which is a way to quickly test out Docker containers. Um, and it, it's been a stepping stone. Um, the diagram is designed deliberately. You know, if you're moving, for example, on GCP from Compute Engine, the next step in terms of elasticity, in my opinion, is not Kubernetes. It's too complicated. You want something simpler that's more like Lambda, and that's Cloud Run. So again, from a pragmatic point, all right, um, you should have um, elastic, properly sized instances, and this is the case of EC2. How do you understand the instances? This is a um, measure of cloud fluency around elasticity that I talk to my customers about. You know, Amazon does not make this information easily available. So it's the use of tools, right? This is an open source tool. It's available on GitHub and again, linked in the slide where you can filter um, your EC2 instance types by your needs. And it also has the pricing. It's kind of cut off on here, but you need to have some sort of capacity for understanding. And I listed Amazon because they're the most difficult to do this with. Google is a little bit easier. They actually display the pricing in the console. And I think Azure does that too. But Amazon's notorious. I mean, there's there's memes out there about, you know, losing your job because you left the EC2 instances on or you just got the biggest ones. And I have had this case in genomics. I had a customer actually last year that said they were going cloud native and they should have had a cluster. And they just simply picked the largest EC2 instance that you could get and left it on. And I just said, oh no, <laughs> this is not what you want to do because this core concept of elasticity is key to success with getting value out of cloud. Speaking of that, if you picked that biggest EC2 instance and just left it on, why would that be bad in terms of your cloud costs? Well, it would be bad because the cloud constantly evolves and you probably don't need it on at all times. Now, interestingly, for my work, despite the importance of EC2 or the appropriately sized VM in genomics, because of the data volume, compute is just a small part of getting value from cloud. Now, I realize that those of you listening are probably not in genomics, so your compute bill could very well be the biggest part. And that, you know, pre-genomics, that was the case for a lot of my customers. But showing you the future, where we need to optimize is compute, yes, but data very much yes, because of the volumes of data. I had one customer oh, back before the pandemic, they were spending $250,000 a month on bucket storage. And by simply changing the bucket storage from the default of multi-regional to single region, which was met their needs, we reduced that bill by 100,000 a month. And again, the reason I tell you this is because I think genomics on the cloud is the future for many data cases because of the vast volumes of data we're collecting across devices. So speaking of cloud evolving, the next uh, evolution really is a reflection of that data. This is work that I did, as was mentioned, with that group out in Australia to take an on-prem genomic process that took 500 hours to run and to cloudify it. This is the intermediate level of work where, again, you don't really have to understand the architecture, but the key point is all those little red buckets. Our cloud optimization was around data. So a, a second pillar is to use the correct service for your particular use case. Data is moving in the genomic scale off of file systems into buckets because that storage is exponentially more scalable and cheaper. And in this case, we had great success. We took this process from 500 hours to like five hours. Now we did subsequent uh, 
uh, improvement that took it down to 10 minutes. Um, but this going from 500 hours to five hours was a really important intermediate step and uh, uh, an example of cloud fluency. I actually wrote all this up and this, cause this was the first, one of the first examples of a data lake um, for genomics back in 2017 and it's on my medium. So again, linked. So what is elastic data? You know, I come out of data warehousing. So, you know, it'd say, well, where's your databases? Well, they're still there and there's still cases where they're best fit. But in my genomic world, the big release, of course, was S3 from Buckets, um, which really, in my opinion, launched the cloud as much as EC2 did. And then the secondary releases are around um, PaaS or data as a service. So the big one in 2011 was BigQuery from Google, which is SQL on top of files, which I think to this day, and what is it, 10 years later, customers don't fully understand. Subsequent really important releases um, were Spark on Kubernetes, which is actually what we used in that previous architecture to get it down to 10 minutes. And then of particular interest, because I know it's always great to know what's relevant right now, is this newly released set of services. And to my understanding, Google's out first with Dataplex around data mesh, which is a data catalog across data lakes. And um, this in my domain of genomic scale data is a game changer. Because if you think about it, if you have data sprawled across your organization and the internet in file buckets, basically, how are you going to find that? And it, you know the uh, challenges during the pandemic of collaborating within and more importantly, between global health organizations really escalated the need for this, because uh, with the amount of genomic data that is now being sequenced because of the decreasing price and the health needs, this is a really exciting area to work in. And there's high demand. So again, if you're watching this and you're thinking about what you should do for your career to increase your um, you know, career growth, if you have interest in the data area, I would say you really want to start exploring um, implementing data mesh with customers. So because of that, this is actually um, just an example of something that I did. I made this for myself and my customers, and this is the Google version. Um, it's important with this growth of services on cloud that you create these maps for um, yourself and your customers. So this is a mind map map of um, different data capabilities on Google Cloud that, again, I created for this customer so that we can figure out which parts of it are going to um, be providing the most value and are the most priority to implement because the challenge, you know, most of these vendors have over 300 services now is how do you pick the right one? Um, and the data area to me is the most interesting area, probably because of my background, but it's similar in networking and security and the other areas as well. So I kind of, that's a high level look, but the challenge, you know, to get to that 95% success rate is you have to pick the right set of services, but then once you get into the services, you have to understand them deeply because what that impacts is the, you know, service that you provide to the customer and how much it costs. So this is an example from Google. There's a, a developer advocate that's referenced here where she is um, drawing these sketch notes that uh, drill in to help you to quickly look at um, services that are core. This, of course, is persistent disks that you would associate to um, VM. So it's kind of the opposite of a data mesh. It's like an individual disk. And if you look at it, you know, it is challenging that you have, what is it, five different uh, ways that you can select it at the highest level. And then you have another dimension of um, three different ways, whether it's local SSD, persistent, and all that. Again, the key uh, pattern on this is for the services that you select, do you understand the implication of the configuration options? And again, I'm going to go back to that client I had where we saved them $100,000 a month by changing one setting on a bucket. It really matters. It really matters in terms of cloud fluency. So speaking of cloud fluency, where are we now? Um, so again, it doesn't matter so much the architecture. This is an architecture I was working with um, a genomics customer this year. What matters is if you take away nothing else, there's more squares, which is the more services. <laughs> so first you have to pick 
the best fit services. So you have to understand from a high level, and then you have to configure them correctly. An additional aspect of this is almost all of my work really for several years in data processing also includes machine learning. And that's reflected here on the bottom right with the green square for SageMaker. And that really should be a number of squares, kind of ran out of room here, because um, elastic machine learning is, I think, at the tip of the cloud fluency iceberg. So what does that look like? In 2007, it was really just open source libraries. Um, the big release for me was 2015 was TensorFlow open sourcing, and then um, Amazon built SageMaker. In addition to that, um, Google has uh, continued to make um, neural networks and machine learning more usable in particular. I mean, all of them are, but uh, Google in particular with AutoML. Also notable releases are Google Colabs, which allows you to have Jupyter Notebooks in a browser, um, and it's sort of a path to get to full cloud for uh, data science. And Amazon has a, a pretty new release called SageMaker Labs, which does the same thing. So it allows this elasticity in that you have data scientists who have some or no cloud, and they can go from their desktop, in the case of Colabs and SageMaker Labs, to a browser-based SaaS tool where they can try out their notebooks that can then be um, built in a machine learning uh, life cycle on the cloud. So that was a lot on the first pattern, but it's the most important pattern, but there are more. The second pattern by contrast is a little bit more, um, I don't know, straightforward, simple, but as important in a lot of ways. So the cloud smell associated to this is how do you get somebody working on the cloud, whether it's a developer or an end user? And um, it continues to astound me that uh, people do not work on the cloud for the cloud. This is from 2013. And you can see it's a third part of a three-part series of blog posts of how to set up um, for development for an AWS service, Elastic Beanstalk. Install this, configure this, update this, da, 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 da. clients I've had recently. I mean, it took me as a consultant, I don't know, two weeks to, to be able to access the console. It's kind of ridiculous. Um, so I realize you have to have controls, but the sort of antithesis of this is you want to work in the cloud, on the cloud. And again, because I just happen to be doing a lot with GCP, um, this is the console, which is fine to do, use when you're learning and teaching. Of course, when you're deploying to production, you're going to use script because you have the concept of infrastructure as code. But on the bottom left, you see the terminal um, or cloud shell, which is a VM that has all the tools you would need installed and configured. So again, rather than spending days or weeks setting things up, you just click on that basically. And um, if you click the open editor, you get a IDE that's browser-based that again has all the tools. It is just crazy to me that people um, do not use these tools more often. I've actually, again, written a Medium article about this because um, for years now, I install nothing on my laptop. It's like a dumb terminal and I just work in the cloud. So the third cloud pattern um, for uh, successful deployment is organizational success. And again, this probably reflects the nature of my work, which is an independent consultancy. So although I come in sometimes at the beginning of projects for proof of concepts, I'm often brought in, I call myself a cloud plumber when things don't work. <laughs> so, um, so the cloud smell is, does it work? Um, so I am continually surprised by when I ask the question, which end users are using this solution? The answer is all too often none. Um, in my opinion, software is not um, uh, usable unless it's usable by end users. If a developer can run it on his or her desktop, it's not usable It's if an end user. And then the next question is how many end users? Um, and I find more often than not, there are assumptions that are not measured. Again, a very easy thing to do is in the genomics use case where everything goes into file buckets, what percentage of your, um, in my case, genomic researchers have uploaded a file to a bucket? If you can't 
answer that question, you don't know how many people are using your solution. So the, the, uh, the counter to this is you want to figure out your minimum viable anything if you don't have any software working and deploy it as soon as possible. And this is something that I've actually been working on. I literally was called into this project. Um, I've been working on it about four months now where um, millions of dollars were spent to write genomic pipelines for a customer and they were never deployed. And so it's been two years. And the very first thing I said is, okay, let's take this pipeline that runs for 14 hours and let's get a one hour version of it because you have to get a minimum. You have to get the, this is, you know, an agile principle. You have to get rapid feedback, right? And in whatever domain you're in, no matter how complicated it is, it's possible to slice off a minimum so that you can get something working and build from there. And I'm really happy to say that just coincidentally, the end user ran the full pipeline yesterday. It wasn't been a good week um, in production. So it works. Um, this comes out of lean manufacturing, minimum viable concept. When I, you know, old school, when I was a DBA, it was a minimum viable report, and now it's a minimum viable pipeline. But the key is a small version all the way to the end user and then iterate. So um, to uh, get that going, I'm a big fan of drawing. You know, I'm an architect, a coding architect, if you will. And so um, to me, a picture is the way to communicate much faster and much more globally than words. And oftentimes when you have these stuck projects, you have an assumption of understanding through lots of words and lots of documents and lots of code that nobody reads. So it's, you know, it's, it might seem sort of childlike, but it works. So this is uh, one that I drew for this particular project that we want to take this, you know, complex pipeline that has 54 tasks in it. And we want to just get it down to three tasks and, and have an in and an out. And I do think that this thinking is part of getting to MVP. I've seen it many times over the years. So we looked at um, cloud patterns as it relates to technology. The other aspect of um, successful software is people. And so uh, the fourth cloud pattern and the subsequent patterns are under the people sphere. And the first one is technical manager. So um, the association here for the challenge is um, uh, we, we just use lift and shift. Um, and you might say, well, well, how does that relate to technical manager? That means the manager is not technical um, because they don't understand the different capabilities that are available in cloud. Yes, you might want to use lift and shift, but you might also want to use serverless. Um, this article that I've uh, quoted here from this um, uh, person in the industry, Lee Atkinson, he actually is saying here that in cases where you use lift and shift, it's becoming increasingly the case if you don't know what you're doing, that the overall bill is higher in cloud. And that's because of the amount of services you have now. So there are cases to, for example, just go ahead and put your database in the cloud, but it's more often the case that it's going to be a better fit to use parts and pieces or services that are more granular and a better fit. And that requires more sophistication on understanding how to work with the cloud. So I often find that managers are people who were developers who have, don't have a lot of experience as managers. I find that, or I find managers who were not developers. So the middle managers that I work with often are kind of having skill deficiencies. And so part of getting success in these projects is to help the managers with these five habits that I think reflect a successful technical manager. The first one is to, to um, get very frequent updates. They can be short and make sure the manager is listening more than they're talking. Um, to encourage and support the manager in asking clarifying questions that help the manager to communicate to whoever they're managing, whether up or down. Um, so act as a translator, basically, if the manager isn't understanding the technology. Uh, the next is involving all the way up stakeholders so they understand what's happening and a level that, of detail they need and all the way to the users so that they understand what's happening and why it's happening. I mean, I'll make an example from genomics. I tell every user over and over, I know change is challenging and it's disruptive to your workflow, 
but you're out of space. You, you can't not go to the cloud in this particular customer. And just being that straightforward about it and explaining that the existing solution is literally out of space now, and they're already queuing, helps the users to understand why the change is important and helps them to want to participate in it. You want to measure um, deployed software and deployed software in my mind is all the way working for end users. And um, they want to be part of the technical training. Um, again, have had a really good week professionally. Uh, not only did the end user run the pipeline on production after two years of nothing, the manager ran it. And I think the manager, well, I think they were both really happy, but I think the manager was happier and more surprised than the, the end user. It was a good, good day. So speaking of managers, I pulled a page from my work as a data warehouse person um, building dashboards with KPIs for business metrics. And a technique that I use to communicate with managers is I use code or solution dashboards. And this is one, again, from a current project. So it doesn't really matter so much the the dimension across the top. What matters is you can look and see there are two pipelines. It's DNA and RNA in this case. And you can see quickly the status. So you can see the DNA pipeline is not in as good shape as the RNA. And as a manager, you can see this optimized um, issue is a blocker because it's got the two red X's. You know, managers need to have technical details summarized in a way they can action. So red, yellow, green works. I mean, there's a reason that, you know, dashboards have been around for a long time. So I, I, another version of this is I will take cloud architectures and I will color them over the top, red, yellow, green. Like this section of the architecture doesn't work red. This section we are testing, but we're not sure yellow. This section fully functions and we're testing as MVP with all the way to the customer green. Again, it might seem um, overly simplified, but you know, cutting through the complexity is part of a higher level pattern for cloud um, success. So you know, I've been saying it all through. Probably I should have put this first. It's right up there with Elastic Services. Um, you know, this end user focus. It's it's an agile principle, so it shouldn't be too surprising. But it is you know key in my work as a technical professional in cloud. So it's been tricky with the pandemic, you know, we've moved to, you know, this um, uh, all remote, but as I work with different teams, I mean, if I see this and this happened with my current team, you know, it's a um, well-known thing that the structure of the team reflects the structure of the software that's um, presented the Conway's law. Um, I had a person who, I literally have never seen her and I've been working on this project for six months. And it's not that she has children or dogs or whatever. It's just, and we have, this is the case with this particular client. We have meeting after meeting after meeting where no one turns on their cameras. I mean, they're checked out. And so how do you, you know, um, address this? Well, the first thing is don't have meetings if you don't need them. So send emails or other types of communication. The second thing is get the group to be smaller and turn your camera on be that person. <laughs> so build with the users. You know, I have, I've kind of decomposed this uh, previous slide into having one-on-one -on -one, um, working meetings uh, with basically all the people on the slide. And, you know, when it's just the two of us, we turn the cameras on and we work together and involving users from the beginning for that MVP from day one, even before anything worked on the pipeline, we built something using the technology so that they would understand the technology. So these uh, cl cloud patterns for people, technical manager, end user focus. The third one is learning culture. And again, this is you know core agile stuff, but applied to cloud. So this is a pundit from Gartner, uh, Lydia Leong. And uh, she wrote this, again, conveniently, all this stuff is conveniently this month. And basically, she said cloud skills gap has reached a crisis level in many organizations. The smell is when the manager of the team says, oh, yeah, we don't really do training. We just figure it out. Well, you don't, because you don't just figure out 300 services. I personally spend 25% of my professional time studying 
and I have for 11 years. And it's one of the key reasons I'm successful. When you are in an industry that moves as quickly as cloud, having formal time for learning is part of the job. And if you don't have that, you're going to have that 75% number. So what's tricky is to figure out how that implements for the team, because learning is evolving. You know, in the old days, we went to a class and sat in the room for eight hours. Well, you don't do that anymore. And now you don't even go anywhere. And how do you get people to pay attention when for their work, they're already um, on Zoom calls? So, you know, the key I think is interactivity. And so that's actually something I'm working on with this client. So this animation is crazy on purpose because that's one thing I have found. Teaching cloud is not linear. Um, it's more of a just in time. And I was trying in my sort of bad um, graphics sort of way to animate um, how it goes. You know, like you probably saw some of those boxes pop up and go away because teams aren't ready, right? So as a technical trainer, which is some aspect of my work with teams, you have to have be embedded and you have to understand at what point will they, for example, be interested in automating their deployments to use something like Terraform rather than scripts. Because if you just throw it all at them in the beginning, it's not gonna stick, it's too much. Another aspect of this interactivity is building a sandbox. And this is something I'm working with on this big client right now because, because they've had the pain of failure, um, they now are more interested in spending some time in learning. Well, how are we gonna do it, right? So again, I like to be pragmatic so this is from the earlier drawing of data mesh, where I was trying to understand the services that could provide value, which is something I'm actually working on right now. I'm trying to learn how to do it myself because it's a new set of services. Well, once I can make professional recommendations and share what I've learned, then I will, as a next step, create a little demo that I can work with the team and say, okay, this is where I think these services can add value and let's explore them a bit together. And then once we get sort of a baseline, then we can figure out at what level we want to expand this interactive discussion slash training with the rest of the team. And we can build a sandbox environment that they can then experiment with. So I've thrown a lot of information at you in this talk, and I'm hoping that at least um, some of it or most of it will be uh, useful to you in however you're implementing cloud, because I want you to move from that 75% to the 95%, but it's not without um, concentrated and thoughtful effort that you get there. I know I've been repetitive, but it's a pattern that if you take nothing else away from this talk, I implore you to get closer to your users. Yes, I work with the developers and the infrastructure team, and they are my partners and collaborators. But the people who I serve in my work are the genomic researchers, the medical doctors, and the people who then publish on the data. And those are the people who I focus my conversations and I ask questions like, what do you dream about being able to do from a research point? Because that's how we not only get success in cloud, but we drive cloud forward in our particular domain. We look at what's most interesting to our users. And to, to uh, kind of kick in this with the aspirational, um, this is a tweet and this is very domain specific, but I'll just read it. Available in six new Terra workflows, users can now analyze a whole genome in over one hour with this technology compared to 24 hours in a CPU-based environment and reduce the compute cost by more than half. So let's do great things together. So those are our patterns. And there's my article. And I like to give you something to learn with. So here's an, a repo where I have over 100 resources. And there's the address of the repo. And I'm Lynn Langit. Thanks so much for listening.
All right. Thanks a lot, uh, Lynn. That was amazing. All those resources and the patterns. I try to capture them, <laughs> but I, I'm sure I'll have to go back and watch the video again. Uh, there's a lot of information you were able to pack in. Uh, appreciate that. Cool. Uh, just uh, want to see if there are any questions from the audience. We could, uh, you know, maybe spend 10 minutes, uh, take the questions. So folks, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A section and uh, fire away. Don't be shy. <laughs> All right. Uh, maybe while we wait, uh, Lynn, I'll give, uh, I'll, I'll start off with one of the questions. And I think we were briefly talking about this uh, backstage in terms of, uh, you know, more and more companies are realizing that the cost on cloud is uh, getting quite high for them, uh, especially as they start scaling. Uh, and maybe it's not a fair comparison to what they used to have versus all the benefits they get and stuff like that. So from purely from a cost perspective, if someone's still contemplating either moving to the cloud or is already on cloud and thinking of moving off the cloud, uh, what would be your recommendation to them? Well, again, it really depends on the volume. You know, again, my lens is very skewed because of working in genomics. Genomics um, really can't not use the cloud because of the extreme data volumes. Um, it would not be practical. But now there are other domains. I think government is a really good example of this, where there's other um, needs such as extremely... Um, tight security. Uh, the cloud, of course, has great security, but um, whether they're going to use the um, government version of the cloud, like Amazon's GovCloud in the US, for example, um, but there are, are some cases that for security, you would want to have either redundancy or um, not on the cloud, some cases for financial as well, um, because you have the resources. So it's always a, an analysis of what is your set of business needs and, um, you know, wh where are you going to get the most value? Um, you know, in the case that we were talking about in, in India before the, before I, I came on, when you have the, um, ability to have, um, resources, data centers, um, when you have, you know, companies like, like those that you're working with in India that have, um, the infrastructure that people can work with. Um, that's it's sort of a different case. I, I see less of that in the U.S. And, and I think it's because the public cloud, you know, originated in the U.S. So, um, you know, it's the case here, but it's more often it would be hybrid rather than um, hybrid between clouds rather than hybrid on-prem um, to, to go to, to, to add on-prem. Now, if you have existing on-prem to extend your on-prem, okay, that'll happen. But I don't see that as often. So that was like really interesting to me. To, to hear about the, you know that situation in um, in, in in India. Cool. All right. Uh, Tom Gilb is in the audience and he's uh, saying it's a great talk. Thanks so much uh, at many levels, Lynn. And uh, he also I think has a question or a suggestion about uh, you know and Tom earlier in his keynote had talked about kind of broadening the term to stakeholders as opposed to just users uh, because of, uh, you know, we do serve uh, multiple stakeholders. Uh, so he's, I think he's just uh, kind of probably question asking that, uh, would you consider broadening the term to stakeholders as opposed to just users? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I mean, users is kind of like um, has a negative connotation. So I always say end users and like, I always, I always just say who they are. So in my case, it's like bioinformatics researchers, doctors, like I don't use the word users really because uh, I, you know, again, I've just seen over the years, too many tech people, Oh, those users, Oh, those users. Right. And I'm the other way. I'm like, Oh, my users. Oh, wow. You know, like, my doctor used my thing. Oh, yay. You know, so it's a, I want to kind of flip that over because, you know, um, we as technologists serve the people that use our software. And if we don't think that way, I think that's one of the reasons there's so much bad software out there. You know what I mean? Um, because again, I just, maybe it's the way my consultancy is, but it is shocking to me how often that answer to 
who, who, which doctors, which researchers, whatever use the software. We don't know. We think a lot. We're not sure. We wish more would. (laughs) (laughs) Cool. Uh, There's a question from Alia. She's saying, what are the uh, basic factors you would consider when you ask to migrate from on-prem to cloud native? Uh, so what, you know, again, like any software project that you, what are the, what are your core, um, you know, business needs? Like I'll just, I'll, I'll put it in genomics cause that's what I know. Right. So I would say, uh, you know, what is the storage capacity of your solution right now? And what, at what percentage is it increasing? So when are you going to run out of storage? How much are you paying for it? Uh, and how is that, is it exceeding your budget? Um, what is the performance? I mean, here's another example you know, what fails. So like there is a pipeline that this client that I have is running and I asked the researcher, how often do you have to rerun it? Cause it fails because the cluster runs out of capacity 50% of the time. So you, then you prioritize because obviously you would prioritize that um, because that's not acceptable based on business needs, right? Because again, sometimes you have to explain, well, if this and again, I'm getting very specific, but I think that might be helpful for the audience because I was more general in the talk. Um, if this pipeline fails 50% of the time and it takes one day to run, well, how much is the time of your researcher worth? Because you're basically making them 50% less effective. Do, do you know what I mean? And so you have to do that math because unfortunately, and it's again, it's one of the reasons I'm doing this talk. I have not seen the success of projects improve over my 11 years in cloud. I've seen it get worse as the number of services is out there, which drives things like, well, we'll just stay on-prem or we'll just go back to on-prem because it's the complexity is it's blowing people's minds. So again, this idea of like focusing narrowly on where you can get value, which is lean applied, lean cloud. <laughs> Uh, one one other question uh, for me uh, from my side, Lynn, is that uh, in your experience working with the uh, genome researchers and uh, other folks that you work with, what has been like your hardest part of uh, trying to get them to adopt, uh, you know, some of the cloud patterns that you talked about? Uh, to acknowledge that they have to spend time learning the technology, because when you work with scientists their brains are already so busy working on their research problems and trying to keep up with their domain. I mean, they're going to classes all the time. Like uh, the two that I'm working with now for this project, um, (laughs) they're like, we're going to classes about new types of, um, you know, genomic data and new types of sequencing. And uh, we're kind of out of time. We're not doing any actual work anymore between learning cloud with you and between (laughs) learning about genomics. You know, it's interesting in genomics because the sequencing technologies, well, like here's a new thing. I'll just tell you. So the new, one of the new things that they really want to do is um, they're looking a lot at RNA because RNA is, you know, what's expressed downstream and it looks, it shows you what is the effectiveness of the cancer drug, right? So you have DNA, which is what you inherit, right? And then RNA is like diseases you get. Well, the quality of the RNA data gets better and better and better. And there's this huge thing. It's called spatial multi-omics where you can now pinpoint on the tumor where the RNA is, which again, I know I'm getting very detailed, but it's the quality of the data is going like, and so, you know, the challenge is the data quality is just increasing dramatically. And these researchers have to understand like, okay, what can I do with spatial RNA data now? Right. What is it? How do I work with it? And then they have to deal with how do I use the cloud? Right it's a lot. It's so it's a very, I I would say they're right up there with, um, you know, quants with financial analysts. Like it's a really, really front of the pipeline, difficult job to be a bioinformatics researcher right now. It's, it's rewarding, but it's very, so again, as a cloud architect and cloud practitioner, I'm like, how can I simplify? That's why things like using the cloud console that I'm just like, no, they're not installing any tools. They're not configuring anything because we all know as soon as you have 
end users installing. They have Linux, they have Mac, they have Windows, they have different, you know, you, they can't even install a tool. They aren't going to get anywhere, right? Yeah. And that's not going to that's not going to help their cloud journey. Whereas if they can click on the console, that's going to work. It's the simple things. Yeah, I think uh, the, the context here is very important is having that empathy for your uh, for your stakeholders or users in terms of what is that they're trying to accomplish and trying to provide them the simplest path to accomplish their thing rather than just uh, drown them into all the things that you are excited about. Maybe it's like this new cool service, you know, we should try out and, you know, that just maybe overwhelms them and might, might, and, and, back to my question and that's might be uh, where people may uh, you know find it very hard to stay up to speed and just acknowledge that they need to invest time to learn some of these techniques uh, I, I we'll take one last question i know uh, you know uh, we kind of uh, shooting a little over here but uh, uh, this is this one question i think this is uh, gets asked a lot uh, again so i apologize for that but i think uh, generally when when people hear about uh, you know genetic data or genome information uh, being available in the cloud uh, you know there's a natural concern around the security of the data and how do you ensure uh, you know it's 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 in the right hands of people uh, so we'd just love to hear what's your take on that so two things First of all, security is extremely difficult. And um, I find that most people don't do security well enough uh, in their environments they control. I am not a security expert by any means, but uh, through my years, I have always been sort of a, I don't know, like I'll just look for the common sense thing. Like, is, is your door locked, you know, layer zero, right? Um, do people share passwords, right? And what I find is that, it, the security is so difficult that the cloud as a baseline is more secure than any on-prem because they have more people like at Google and Microsoft to do it, right? That's number one, what they provide. Number two is broken record. As you have more abilities with um, services, you have to spend time to learn them. You know, when you first started, it was get IM, you know, users and roles and policies and you're done, Right. Well, it's not that simple anymore. <clears throat> Excuse me. I mean, you have, you know, different levels of VPC and different levels of network trafficking. And then if you have a pipe, you have to, you know, blah, blah, blah. You have to set up all this. It's a specialty, right? And so it's an area that if you have, first of all, on-prem knowledge, that's great. And second of all, I cannot find enough people like in my boutique consultancy. I have a few people that I will bring on for jobs. But it's, again, if you're trying to advance your career and you're interested in it, spend time learning it, get certified, learn all the nuances of it, you know, work with security testing, pen testing groups so you can really understand how to respond to that. Make it your expertise. Um, so the, the, the short answer is it's more secure by default in cloud, but to implement it properly, do all the other things I talked about. Get trained, be an expert find out the business needs and balance. Because if you have this draconian security, then your end users will rebel against it and they will share passwords and they will, and you'll have no security. So it's like any other aspect of cloud, whether it's, you know, your data storage or your speed of your application, you have to, it's a continuum. How much security is appropriate? And it's a, it's a skill combined with experience so that you can understand that. Because if you lock things down too much, then you don't have adoption. Yeah, I think very well put. I often keep joking with folks that, you know, this the most secure thing is uh, is something that's disconnected, buried under the earth, and nobody can see <laughs> it. <laughs> like that's, that's the most secure thing. Uh, but as you start opening up things, you need to figure out, like, you know, what, what what's the appropriate level, because it's a spectrum, and you can, you know, bounce off to either extremes of the spectrum and uh you know run into issues one one side the adoption issues on the other side uh you know losing all the data and other kinds of issues uh but finding that balance i think is 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 the key well one one just additional point because this literally just came up recently in a client is i thought it was very very smart in cloud 
the person, the security lead said, we are not going to stop all the threats. What we're going to do is we're going to alert on them. And I thought that really shows a maturity that, it, that, you know, that's what we can do. We can alert and we can respond, but we cannot because of the parts and pieces in this solution. And that's not right for every solution, but I think that is a good approach um, for usability. The security and usability balance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, I think we've, uh, I think I've answered, I've got picked up most of the questions here. Uh, and again, uh, I think we're just about running out of time, but uh, I want to thank you again, Lynn, for uh, joining us this morning. Uh, greatly appreciate the patterns you've shared and uh, the, the new term uh, code smells, uh, sorry, uh, cloud smells uh, from code smells. Uh, that's that's pretty neat. Uh, is, is this somewhere you're curating all these uh, cloud smells? Uh, could other folks contribute to it? You know, I haven't, I, I actually came up with it for this talk. I was like, cause I want to, and so it would be kind of interesting. So my, my sort of repository is, you know, learning cloud, right. On GitHub. And yeah. I'm, I have a section in there called patterns. So that's actually, thanks. That's a great suggestion. Maybe I will do that. It'll be like the, the Kevlin Henny of cloud <laughs> with his failures. <laughs> He can send you pictures. <laughs> I, know. I don't know if I want to go down that road. But anyway, thank you very much for having me. And thanks to the audience. I hope that it was a you know, good use of your time. All right. Thanks, Lynn. And thanks, everyone, for joining in. Greatly appreciate you uh, staying. And with that, we're going to actually wrap up the conference. Uh, greatly appreciate everyone for being part of this uh, wonderful three days uh, and hope it has been a great learning experience and a great networking experience for all of you. With that, goodbye. Thank you. Mm -hmm.